Welcome everyone to the Spectral Geometry in the Clouds. Today is a special session because it's the uh, under it's been the, the 100 uh, talks today. So uh, Simeon has the uh, honor, or perhaps we have the honor rather to have him give a talk for this uh, um, special number in base 10. And so uh, we have the pleasure of having Simeon Diatlov from MIT today who will speak about the real zeta function at zero for nearly hyperbolic three manifolds. And uh... Thank you very much, Alexandra. It's a great pleasure uh, to be giving the 100th talk. And uh, thank you very much for inviting me. You can hear me, right? OK, great. Well, so today, as I uh, mentioned to Laura, uh, I was uh, incredibly lucky that the other two projects I've been working on has already been spoken about here by my two co-authors. So today I'll present to you um, perhaps a somewhat different or alien kind of uh, spectral problem for most of you, which is a uh, one that comes from hyperbolic dynamics. <clears throat> so I'll speak about the order of vanishing of the real zeta function for the geodesic flow on a negatively curved free manifold. Negatively curved manifold and I'll define what a real zeta function is in a, in a couple of slides. It's some kind of function that's uh, constructed using the lengths of closed geodesics on this manifold. And then I'll be studying the vanishing order at zero of this real zeta function. Why? Well, <clears throat> there is a long history of study of this, which I'll also explain later, but Generally, we think that the zeta function value at zero or the, the order of vanishing at zero, so the singularity at zero, has to do something with the topology of the underlying manifold, which is pretty cool that you have this dynamical quantity. And then from there, you can, you can see a relation to a topological quantity. <clears throat> so in particular, if my metric is hyperbolic, so if it's constant negative curvature, then it was shown back in, in the 80s by Fried, that the order of vanishing of the real zeta function is given by four minus twice the first Betty number, which is you know, the dimension of the Durango homology on one point. <clears throat> so here's a, here's a very neat formula in constant curvature. And the question is what's going to happen in variable curvature? And so in variable curvature, uh, so this is the work that I'll be presenting today. It's joined with uh, Mikhail Tsekic, Ben Kuster, actually Ben, Ben De La Rue. I'm sorry, Ben, I forgot to uh, reflect your name change in my talk slides. And Gabriel Paternan, um, back, uh, well, now two years ago. What we show is that for a generic perturbation of a hyperbolic metric, the order of vanishing changes to four minus once the Betty number. Now, is this surprising or not? I don't know, but to me personally, it was surprising because if we, instead of studying three manifolds, study surfaces, then in older joint work with Zworsky, we showed that in this case, the order of vanishing of the zeta function at zero is always equal to the Betty number, so twice the genus minus two, regardless of whether you're constant curvature or variable curvature. So in dimension two, so for, for surfaces, which are desert closed and negatively curved surfaces, this order of vanishing is a topological, topologically determined quantity. So for a while, Zworski and I thought that this is going to be like that, maybe in all dimensions. Not that we had a proof and for, for a good reason, because it turns out that already in dimension three, the situation is very different. So a perturbation changes this quantity to something that's still topologically determined, but you know, it's, it's a generic perturbation. So this means that the sort of vanishing really depends on things beyond just the, uh, just the, the, the topological information. <clears throat> and the motivation comes from uh, something called Fried's conjecture uh, that relates the values at zero to analytic torsion. And that's, I'll, I'll, I'll mention that at least briefly uh, later, even though our result doesn't say anything about the value or about torsion, but it's an uh, important motivation. All right, so here is the uh, setting now. Let me uh, talk a little bit about uh, the, the setup we have here. So there will be a spectral problem, but it's not immediate where it comes from. So it'll be some time before we get to the, the spectral side of it. So let's uh, consider, you know, for, for now, let's just do in the case of any dimension. I'm going to consider sigma, compact, connected, oriented, for simplicity, uh, Riemannian, manifold of dimension M. 
then the geodesic flow is uh, not a flow in sigma, it's a flow on the sphere bundle, right? Because you need to know the, the position and also the, the direction of velocity to know where your geodesic ends up. So I'm gonna call the sphere bundle as M. So most of the analysis will be done on M and will most of the time be forgetting that it's actually equal to a sigma. And then um, this geodesic flow is actually a contact flow. So you can define a canonical contact one form on the sphere bundle. It's uh, done here. It's the, the only one form you could uh, define basically if you have just the Riemannian, many, just the Riemannian metric. <clears throat> and then, uh, well, it's a contact form. And then the geodesic flow is, uh, the generator of the geodesic flow, which I call X, is the read vector field of this contact form. So it satisfies those two identities that, are, that I'm highlighting here. I think when I move my cursor, you should be able to see where, where it is. So you have a contract structure for the geodesic flow, and that's something that we will be using. We'll be using this contact form and this uh, kind of duality between the contact form and X. Well, it's well known, going back to the work of Anosov, that if uh, G has negative sectional curvature, then the geodesic flow has the Anosov property, even though Anosov, I think, called it the S property. I think his uh, main result was that every U system is also an S system. That's the statement of the theorem. <laughs> but <laughs> anyway, in, uh, in modern terms, we call it an OSAP or a uniformly hyperbolic flow. But this means that the tangent space to M, which remember itself was the sphere bundle, decomposes into three pieces, three sub bundles. The flow direction, E0, the unstable direction, the stable direction. And then you have exponentially fast convert, you know, exponentially fast contraction of the differential of the geodesic flow on the stable uh, tangent vectors in the, you know, in the in the forward time direction and the unstable ones in the backward time direction. So hyperbolicity of the geodesic flow is also something that we will be using very strongly, and that's why we restrict well our theorem is much more restricted than that but generally in this analysis we restrict negative curvature or, or at least things that have this property all right so for later use since i'm going to be using microlocal analysis and microlocal analysis is better done on the cotangent bundle than the tangent bundle i'm going to define um this dual stable and stable uh sub bundles of the cotangent bundle to m and again, M is a sigma, but don't think about sigma. Just think you have this flow on M, which it was the geodesic flow on sigma. And then we, we're just looking at its you know, tangent spaces and cotangent spaces. Let, let's not worry about how those relate to, to, to the geometry of sigma yet. All right, so here are my dual ones and the, the, the order is switched, which makes things uh, convenient later. <clears throat> All right, so th those will come up again. And so those are sub bundles of, the cotangent bundle to M. All right, well, okay, here's the object that we study. So the object is actually very easy to write down, which I think is very appealing. Um, so here's the real zeta function, which is a infinite product. So it's an Euler type product over the length of all primitive closed geodesics. So primitive means it's not a, a positive, you know, it, it's not a multiple of a shorter geodesic. So here is this product. It features lengths of closed geodesics, uh, this T, T gammas. <laughs> and then you have the complex variable lambda. And this converges when real part of lambda is sufficiently large because the number of closed geodesics grows with most exponentially. What's known about the zeta function is that it continues, it actually continues meromorphically to the entire complex plane. You know, once you write a zeta function, it's a, it's a usual thing that you want something that's um, you know, you, you usually write something as a sum or a product or some, some formula that only makes sense usually in a half plane. Like think about the other product for the Riemann zeta function, right? And then you try to continue it to the entire complex plane. And then hopefully you get some zeros or, or poles or something. And that those singularities might tell you something about the original sequence. Now here, we're going to be going pretty deep into the continued region. So we're not going to be able to extract, you know, asymptotics of the geodesics from this. Um, but anyway, so what's known is that it continues meromorphically. That was proved by Giuliani, the Varanian Polycott. And then Zvorsky and I later produced a, a different proof 
uh, which which is the proof that we'll be using in this. Um, it, it pro gives a bit more micro local information that will be useful for us certainly. And um, it's it's been a long study of this uh, meromorphic continuation. So it was first conjectured in, in a related setting by Smail in '67, right? And then, as I said, I'll study the vanishing order of that at zero. So it's it's it's, it's a holomorphic, it's a meromorphic function, and then you uh, you can define the vanishing order. That's just an integer, right? So I'll really be only interested in lambda equals to zero near lambda equals to zero in this. All right. And so the question, as I said before, is can we describe this vanishing order in terms of some topological invariance, for example, in terms of the Betty number? So the Betty numbers of sigma, but the Betty numbers of M, the sphere bundle, are related to the Betty numbers of sigma by, by, by a well-known uh, construction of the, 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 the Giesian exact sequence. All right. <clears throat> All right. So what's known about those? So pe people have studied those uh, for a long time because, well, those are fascinating objects to study. And um, one thing I should say, even though we do not do it in our paper, but in a lot of previous work, it, it comes in handy. You can actually look at more general zeta functions. You can twist by a representation, or this corresponds to taking a bundle with a flat unitary connection. And uh, the, the, the trivial representation would correspond to the old zeta function. Now, this, this twisting helps because uh, you can... Uh, choose a representation so that uh, the Durham complex is a cyclic. So the corresponding Durham cohomology classes that are defined using this representation are zero. Since I'm not going to be using a representation, I'm not going to get into details of how this works here. But um, then um, maybe the earliest, uh, one of the earliest works on, on, on the understanding of singularity of the real zeta function zero was in the hyperbolic case. So that was done by Fried. In the paper already mentioned, in particular in dimension two and three, he computed. I mean, he did it in all dimensions, but here is the results in dimension two and three. Uh, how you compute the order of vanishing? Now, if rho is a cyclic, so if you have an acyclic representation, then this two and four are actually zero because this two and four should really be the zero Betty number. And so you get a function which is um, which is uh, this real zeta function is holomorphic is zero and non-vanishing. And then of course, once you have a holomorphic non-vanishing function where you somehow proved that its order of vanishing is zero at zero, well, it's irresistible to try to understand the value, right? This is the next thing you would try to understand. And Fried did that and he described it in terms of the analytic torsion, which is the same as the Reidemeister torsion, which is a kind of next level topological invariant associated to sigma and rho. And then he conjectured that the same formula for the torsion holes in, in the more general setting of local homogeneous spaces. And uh, which, which, you know, the, these are manifolds, which still have a lot of symmetries. And so it was proved, this conjecture was proved in the setting of locally symmetric spaces, which are, again, spaces with a lot of symmetries. They, 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 they always have a, you know, um, transitive action of a, of a Lie group in particular, among other things. But uh, you, 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 there is still plenty of them beyond just hyperbolic spaces. So that was done by Shen following earlier work. Now, all of the above was in this local asymmetric uh, class where you can use uh, Selberg trace formulas and representation theory. You have a lot of explicit formulas relating various quantities. And you, you can decompose, you know, you, you can think of your, uh, not, not the sphere bundle, but the frame bundle is a quotient of a Lie group. TG mod gamma, you can decompose L2 of that by irreducible representations of, of, of uh, G and so on. So you, you, you can really do a lot of what I would consider more algebraic work here, this compared to what we do. So doing this, you can, uh, you can prove those uh, very nice results. Now, all right. So what I'm going to be talking about is mostly what happens in the non-locally symmetric case. So there you, you know, you, you lose this access to the algebraic tools. What was known is that, well, there was this result with Worski that I already mentioned. So for surfaces, we know what happens, what the vanishing order is. And actually applies in general contact and also flows in dimension three. Then there was some extensions uh, by Hatfield and Borns, uh, Weil and Shen. And uh, there, were, there was a study of uh, volume preserving and also flows, which are not contact. 
So it's kind of an hierarchy of what kind of an offset flow you could have. And then, uh, so that was done by Tsekic and Paternan, and they showed that uh, there is some, sometimes things don't, don't just depend on the topology, but also depend on, on the kind of on, on certain properties of the flow. Now, here's a nice result by uh, Dan Giamuri, Beer, and Shen. Uh, so they proved Fritz conjecture. So they conjecture about the, the value of the uh, zeta function, how it relates to the analytic torsion for any nearly hyperbolic three manifold. It's a special case, of course, but it's still, it's very nice. It's, it's the first result like that in a case which is not locally symmetric. And there are a few more related works which are a, a, a little bit harder to uh, describe the results without introducing a bit more. So I'll, I'll just list. All right, well, so here's our result as advertised before. So we are going to consider now, we'll, we're going to consider three manifolds. More specifically, we're going to take a hyperbolic three manifold, sigma, and GH is the hyperbolic metric. And then we have two results. The first one is that the order of vanishing of the real zeta function at zero for the hyperbolic metric is given by four minus twice the first. The second result is that for a generic conformal perturbation of this GH, so if you take a metric that's a generic conformal perturbation of the hyperbolic metric, then the order of vanishing is four minus one. And here I, I explain specific, explicitly what I mean by generic conformal perturbation. So this is an open dense set of perturbations that, 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 that you can attend. We could probably study also general metric perturbations, but it, it would just be more, more, more technically complicated in some places. And I, I don't think we'll get a different answer by studying general metric perturbations. So we're stuck to the conformal ones which are you know easier for for the writing so yeah this is the first result on instability of the real zeta functions under um of, of, of the order of vanishing at zero under metric perturbation so here the really gives you a fairly large class of manifolds for which the answer in variable curvature is different than the answer in constant curvature and so it just tells you that well the situation becomes much 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 more complicated so we, we don't have a clear understanding of all metrics and probably never will, but maybe we can understand generic metrics. Uh, but in this case, again, the answer will be different than what it is in constant curvature case. Now, part one is this old result of free, but our proof is different, and we use, uh, you know, we reprove uh, Freed's result using microlocal and geometric techniques, which make it possible for us to carry out part two. Okay, so there, there is a, finally, we're, we're getting to, uh, so there was a, you know, it's a spectral geometry seminar, right? So there's been quite a bit of geometry, I wanna think, and there's been even more dynamics so far in the talk, and now we're, we're gonna talk about the spectrum. So what's, what's the spectral, what's, what, what do spectral problems have to do with this? Well, the general idea is that you want to write this dynamical zeta function as a characteristic polynomial of a certain operator. You know, by analogy with matrices, then the order of vanishing at zero would correspond to dimension of generalized eigenspace. And you can try to study the eigen or generalized eigenvalues of your matrix to understand the order of vanishing. And that's basically what we do. Except we don't have a matrix here, we have an operator. And I'll define what the operator is, but it is, it, it's a pretty big operator in the sense that if you try to define this determinant literally by some kind of infinite product, it is not going to converge ever. Well, of course, it, it already, you know, this, this, this doesn't even make sense for zero, right? If you take determinant of lambda times the identity and the, it's an infinite dimensional space, it just doesn't make sense. So the way it should be understood is that the log derivative of that should be the trace of the resolvent. And that resolvent is still not a trace class. So one, one needs the right definition of trace, the so-called flat trace. That is a mi micro locally uh, informed definition of trace that will uh, make it possible to, to define this expression and neuromorphically continue. Well, then one expects that the vanishing order is zero, as I said before, should be the space of generalized eigenstates of this operator at zero. For the real zeta function, the situation is a little bit more complicated because instead of a determinant, I think in supersymmetry, they would call it a super determinant, <laughs> which just means it's, a, it's an alternating product uh, of, uh, of, of determinants. So the vanishing order of the real zeta function 
you, you don't just have one operator, but you have you know, finitely many operators corresponding to different degrees of differential forms. And you have to combine the, these dimensions with, with, with alternating signs together. But ultimately, it reduces to understanding those spaces of generalized resonant forms that I will describe a bit later. And then the strategy is to understand those spaces in terms of the Dirac homology. And that's how you relate it to topological information. So in this talk, I'll mostly focus on the case of one forms. The, the case of zero forms is, is in a way trivial. And then the, the case of one forms is the first interesting case. I'll only talk about two forms a little bit. So, okay, well now some, some specifics. So that was general strategy. Now, how do we, um, how, how does it actually work? So remember my M is going to be the um, sphere bundle of a three manifold. So that's going to be a five dimensional manifold M, right? And then um, X is the generator of the geodesic flow. So it's a vector field on M which generates geodesic flow. So the flow of that is the geodesic. Now the operators that we study, the operators are very simple, very natural geometric operators. They're just the lead derivative with respect to the geodesic flow. So lead derivative with respect to X, acting on differential K forms. The twist in the story here is that you don't study all differential K forms. It turns out what you should study is K forms which are annihilated by X or so so-called perpendicular K forms. So that's a very, very natural operator. The more difficult part in understanding what these resonant spaces are that we need to, or generalized eigenspaces are that we need to, to compute in order to get our vanishing order, comes in the fact that what's the domain of this operator? So it turns out that even if you consider, yeah, maybe I'll take a small detour, again, since this is a spectral geometry seminar, if you consider just the operator X as a differentiation along the geodesic flow, so this corresponds to zero form, the first order partial differential operator, you can see it's going to be essentially self-adjoint on L2. You know, on a compact manifold, any first order symmetric operator is essential. But the spectrum of this operator X on L2 is going to be continuous, except for, uh, for one eigenvalue at zero, the constant function. Everything else is, is continuous, it's continuous spectrum. So you don't expect any kind of discrete spectral information coming out. But what it turns out that we just, we're not using the correct space to study the separator. We're not using the correct domain in a way. So instead of using L2, we should study some kind of distributional space. Now, if you look at a problem like X U equals F, so the, the derivative along a geodesic flow of a, of a function U is equal to F, then if you're not doing things in L2, you could think, okay, maybe we should take U to be smooth, and they have to be smooth. This turns out to be too restrictive. You're not going to get a prep home operator this way because you're not going to have existence. You need a lot more conditions on the right-hand side for it to be the derivative along a geodesic flow of a smooth function. You need the right-hand side to integrate to zero along each closed geodesic. So you see infinity is not the space we need. Well, you could consider the space of distributions, maybe you should be a distribution where solving X U equals F where F is a distribution. Well, that's not the right space for, uh, for the opposite reason because the kernel is too big. Because if you take any closed geodesic, then the delta function on a closed geodesic is a distribution which, uh, which is killed by the generator of the geodesic flow. It's invariant under the geodesic flow. So it turns out that, however, you can define just the right kind of space using the fact that the flow is hyperbolic called anisotropic Sobolev spaces. I'm not going to get into the details of how these work, but with these spaces, you can make the resolvent family of the operator to be a Fredholm operator of index zero. So you can really study it. It's like an operator with discrete spectrum. Effectively, it's the spaces, you know, the operator will no longer be symmetric. So it's not a self-adjoint spectral problem, but uh, you will have a spectral problem with, um, with discrete spectrum here. Right, and so that's that's the kind of spectral problem that we generally consider in this setting. Yeah, so there is a very long uh, uh, list of you know references in this. You know, this this this, this, this has been around for some time, and we'll use the my prolocal approach to those spaces, which originates in the works of uh, for Rorschach and for Shostry. Now that we have this resolvent family, which is Fredholm, so then we take its inverse. You're going to get a Fredholm. You know, you're going to get a Neuromorphic family of operators with poles of finite rank. And so that's what I, you know, that's a kind of spectral I'll study. 
And then the poles of this resolvent are the polycultural resonance. So remember, we were trying to take the trace of this, and that was the, uh, the log derivative of, of our zeta function. All right. Well, if we look at those, so what are the corresponding eigenstates? These are the so-called generalized resonance states. They are written here, which is the usual definition of a generalized eigenstate, except you need your u. Now, you know, your u is a current. So it's a distributional valued differential k form on my manifold m. And well, you need some power of the derivative to kill that. And it has to be in the domain of the operator, which I'll specify a little bit more later. And so what we did uh, with Worski is we showed that the, we basically executed the strategy that I described before with a characteristic uh, polynomial you know, for formal strategy and showed that uh, the order of vanishing of the real zeta function in zero is an alternating sum of the dimensions of these spaces of generalized rest. Right. So that's, again, kind of by analogy with how the order of vanishing of a characteristic polynomial of a matrix at some point is equal to the dimension of the space of generalized eigen, eigenstates at this point. This is oh, sorry. And so this, this, uh, this, this result, it's ultimately it's, it's just an identity, right? But we, uh, the, the, the proof uses a fair amount of analysis that I'll almost entirely sweep under the rug here uses propagation of singularities due to hormone, or it uses radial estimates uh, going back to Melrose's work in the 90s, and it uses the atia bothill and trace formula to relate closed geodesics to the flat trace of the resolvent. So this is this trace formula is how the closed geodesics, which were used in the definition of the zeta function, finally entered it. So now that we know how to express this order of vanishing at zero in terms of the dimensions of these still quite mysterious spaces, at least you will believe me that um, the theorem that I presented before follows from uh, this more detailed description of the dimension of the spaces, which we put. So here, here is a table of the dimensions of the spaces of forms. So, you know, my manifold M is five dimensional, but I'm looking at perpendicular K forms. So they have to be killed by the generator of the geodesic flow. And so this means that the interest, you know, in non-trivial cases are zero, one, two, three, and four forms. And so here is the dimension of the uh, of these uh, resonant spaces for a hyperbolic case and for generic conformal perturbation case. And you know, if you take the alternating sum, then then you see you, you get the numbers that we get uh, before. But it's much easier to market the dynamical zeta function because it's something that you can define very simply. And then this order of vanishing is something that again you can define simply and um rather than getting into what these spaces are but really what, what we are after is we're trying to compute the detailed structure of these spaces and there is a certain symmetry here you can see that the uh, k and uh, four minus k k's are going to be the same so really we only need to study forms and dimension zero one well, much simpler than concrete or just just an explicit idea. so we, we compute these dimensions and that's how we get the order of vanishing of the zeta function now how do we do this all right so that's where it gets a little bit thick because i have to describe to you at least a little bit well what are these generalized resonant states I mean, one part we know, they should be currents and they should be killed by some power of the lead derivative. But the, the problem is what's, what's the domain of the operator? So what kind of regularity assumptions do we need to put on those? And it turns out that if you just study, if you don't study the, the, the prep home problem in itself, if you just study the, uh, you know, the, the eigenstate, so to speak, then there is a cleaner way to formulate it, and that is the wave front set of the corresponding current should be in the dual unstable, uh, should be contained in this dual unstable uh, bundle, which I introduced some time ago. Now, <laughs> this only leaves one question, what's a wave front set? And that's a question that I'm not going to answer here in detail, but you can think of it as a, the wave front set is a generalization of singular support. So singular support of a distribution tells you at which points it is not locally C infinity. But if you think about it, for a function to be C infinity and say compactly supported is the same as the Fourier transform rapidly decaying. I only ask my Fourier transform to be rapidly decaying in some directions when I go to infinity and not others. If I combine this with the notion of singular support, which has spatial localization, so I get this kind of both spatial localization and Fourier localization, I get something called the wavefront set. 
it takes some work to understand that the subject actually makes sense, which I'm not going to do here. Luckily, it was uh, done by Hormander for us uh, some uh, 50 years ago now, 60 years ago. Um, and it's a kind of, it's a standard object to study in microlocal analysis. And so this wavefront set tells, you know, if the wavefront set is empty, this means that your U is smooth. And a wavefront set is always a kind of closed sub, sub, um, uh, subset of the, uh, of the cotangent bundle without the zero section. Well, our requirement turns out to be that the wavefront set of U is contained in this dual unstable bundle which is something that's it's, it's defined using the hyperbolicity of the flow. So you can see that, and when you see what pops out, you can see that this really only makes sense when the flow is hyperbolic. And what is more is that we fix a time direction here, because if, if you reverse the direction of the flow, stable and unstable change. <clears throat> that's the one that we study. The reverse time direction corresponds to the to the to the adjoint operator, but you, you have to make the choice. All right. So this this turns out to be this wavefront set condition turns out to be just the right kind of condition for the equation x u equals f. So the derivative of u along the geodesic flow is equal to f to have a unique solution, modular finite dimensional space. So that turns out to be the, the correct condition. Oh, sorry, wait. Sorry. Yes. I just wanted to let you know you have a question in the chat. Um, oh yes, I, I hid everything. Let me see. How do I? There's already uh, a I can read it out that. to you. Uh, so well, it's good that people already... are listening. Y yes, I am reading. It's unstable. <laughs> okay, that's good. yeah, that's right. EU star. Okay. Uh, the question is: Is EU star related to you? No. So here, U is just a function. U and EU star is U for unstable. EU star is fixed. It's the where am I? Where am I? I introduced it along. Hey, there you go. It's at the bottom here. There's not too many letters in the English alphabet, so I'm writing off it. So it, it's just, it's defined using the stable and stable decomposed. All right, where, where was I in this whole thing? Okay, all right. So that's the spaces that we need to study. And of course, it's not very satisfactory to you because you don't know necessarily what a wavefront set is, but th those, those spaces are nice because in particular, they are closed under the differential, differential operators. So wavefront set is not enlarged by applying a differential operator to your U. And a lot of the things we're doing actually in this paper is we're relying on the analysis built somewhere else and doing kind of algebra really the differential geometric computations. And those spaces are very nice because you can do a lot of uh, natural operations with C infinity. You can do those operations also with these spaces. All right, well, okay. So now we need to understand this generalized resonance state. Now, how do we do it? You know, if, if you're teaching a linear algebra course and you have a, you know, you, 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 you need your students to compute the Jordan normal form, how are they going to do it? Let, let's say your matrix is already nil potent, so you just have this here. Well, well right, so how, how do you do it? Right. Let's, let's not assume our matrix is nil potent, but instead, if you want to understand the generalized eigenspace of a matrix, you usually start by understanding the eigenspace, right? So you first solve the equation P U equals zero. And then after you solve that, how do you solve P square U equals zero? Well, if P square U equals zero, then P U is in the first space, right? And then you can, uh, you can uh, continue from there. So here we'll also start with the space of resonance states. You see, the spectral problem is not self-adjoint here. And so my, in some situations, we do actually get generalized resonance states. So we do have to respect this difference. I should also say, for those of you who like Hodge theory, there is a kind of funny formal analogy. You know, the Hodge Laplacian is d delta plus del d, right? And uh, d square and del square are both, uh, are both uh, about zero. Now, I, this Lx, the lead derivative by Cartan's magic formula is dIx plus Ixd. So, and a formally Ix plays the role of del in some of the algebraic manipulations. However, when you do Hodge theory, at least on a compact manifold, one of the first things you show is that if the Laplacian u is equal to zero, then both du and del u are equal to zero. And that's done by integration by parts and using the fact that del is d star. There is nothing like that here. Can't be in the kernel of this thing and not be closed or not be in the kernel of Ix. 
So we have to be careful. I mean, here we're already considering things which are in the kernel of X because we're in this perpendicular bundle, but those resonance states, they do not have to be closed. So the quote unquote Hodge theory here would be much more complicated than the compact Riemannian case. All right, well, for later use, there's also co-resonance states. Again, the problem is not self-adjoint. So the, 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 those are elements in the kernel of the adjoint of the operator. And the, the domain changes to ES star when you uh, look at the edge, it turns out. And there is a natural uh, identification of those with resonance states um, because the geodesic flow is time reversible. And then you, you can pair resonance states and co-resonance states. So you, you can, you know, you cannot multiply distributions in general, but you can compute an inner product of resonance state and co-resonance state because the wave francis don't intersect. So that's something that we will also very analogous to matrices, you know, in, in, a, in when, you, when you're studying matrices, you naturally want to pair elements in a kernel of a matrix with elements in the kernel of the adjoint. All right. And in particular, you can see that this pairing between resonance states and co-resonance states, if this pairing is non-degenerate, that's equivalent to semi-simplicity, which means that there are no Jordan blocks. So all generalized resonance states are just resonance states. It, it's a nice way to check there are no Jordan blocks. So, so for, for a matrix uh, P, um, there are no Jordan blocks at zero is the same as saying that the kernel of P is uh, transversal to its range, right? And that's the same as saying by, you know, identifying the range by duality. It's the same as saying if you take elements in the kernel of P and kernel of P star, the pairing on those elements as, as you know, vectors and co-vectors is not degenerate. That, that, that makes it possible sometimes to establish some simplicity by computing this pairing and showing that it's not. Well, as I said, I'll focus on case k equals one, so one forms. One of the reasons is because the case k equals zero is, um, turns out to be simple or you, you using standard tools in this business, you can show that the resonant uh, states, generalized or not, is just a, there's only one, the constant function, and there's nothing else interesting there. Right, so in particular, the dimension is one. So now I'm going to try to explain to you a little bit what's happening. I'm not necessarily going to explain how we do it. Half of it is explicit computation, which is, you know, can, can, can be repeated. And um, how to describe the spaces of generalized resonance states in the hyperbolic case. So, well, okay, I'm, I'm not getting to the hyperbolic case yet. Okay, so there is a little bit more of general theory we can do here before we get to perturbations of hyperbolic spaces. And that's, we can study resonant one forms. So LX kills you and you are in this space, which are also closed. Th this becomes really kind of man manipulations and uh, uh, differential geometry. So let's look at the resonant states, which are closed. You see, when you write, when you write this condition, uh, to be a resonant state is the same as saying IXU is zero. That's something we imposed in the bundle. And IXDU is zero. That's what it means for LXU to be zero by Cartan's magic formula. So, okay, so let's study the closed one. So that's where IXU is zero and DU is also equal to zero. Kind of in Hodge theory would be like harmonic functions, right? D and L are both zero. Well, what happens is you have a closed one form. Okay, it's not a form. It's a current because it's distributional value. But for the Ramco homology on a compact manifold, it doesn't matter what regularity class you use to define your Ramco homology. You can use C infinity, you can use a Sobolev class, you can use distributions, and you're going to get exactly the same cohomology class. And one of the major reasons is because the, if you think how Hodge theory is proved, the typical way is to uh, use the elliptic parametrics for the Hodge Laplacian, that's a pseudo differential operator, and that preserves all of those classes. Well, it turns out that this parametrics also preserves our classes with the wave front set. And so if we define the cohomology theory using those classes, no matter what, what kind of set I put here in my wave front set restriction, I'm gonna get the same kind of thing. So what I can do is I can take this current and I can look at the cohomology class of that. That, that's a well-defined thing. But more specifically, if I have any current in D prime U star and it's closed or more, more generally DU is small, I can always write it out as a decompose it as a smooth closed one form for which the usual Jerome homology class makes sense, plus D of a rough form in the same class. Okay, so it turns out 
that so we have this cohomology map you, you can do it on any on any resonant k-forms which are closed right here i didn't use it it's a one form yet but it turns out that on one forms it's an isomorphism so if you just want to identify closed resonant one forms they're in one-to-one -one correspondence with their own cohomology classes the issue of course is not all resonant not all generalized resonant one forms could be resonant one forms it could be jordan blocks and more seriously, in a way, not all resonant one forms are necessarily closed. The closed resonant one forms are in one to one correspondence with the with homology classes by right? just this projection. And uh, the way you prove it is actually pretty simple. Um, I don't know which, uh, well, once, one, once you have the technology coming from those and isotropic spaces and stuff, uh, once you know that this D prime is the right space, uh, let's see, which, which, which one should I show? Well, how about surjectivity? So, how would you show surjectivity of pi one? Well, you take a smooth one form, which is closed, and you want to say, I want to add D of something to it to make it in this resonance state. Well, it turns out that what you need is, well, so your U, your resonance state is going to be V or smooth form minus DF for some distribution F, a scalar distribution F. And when you think, well, what, what does it mean to be a resonance state? Well, DU is automatically zero and IXU should be zero which means that you're solving this cohomological equation, xf is ixv. And as I said before, the Fredholm property that we have shows that this equation will have a solution in the correct space. So that's how you do it. Modular ixv integrating to zero, which is something that's easy. To do. And there is a similar, well, in, in even simpler, you can should show that this is in general. But we really reduce to the case of functions here, which is why um, this only really works for one form, so as, as neatly as it does here. So now, um, let me tell you a bit about what happens in the hyperbolic case, and then I'll tell you a little bit about what happens for perturbations. And again, I'll focus on one forms. So what we showed is that resonant one forms, which are closed, correspond to the wrong homology classes, and the Betty number of M is the same as the Betty number of sigma. That's one. So M is the sphere bundle of sigma. Well, it turns out that in the hyperbolic case, there are more one forms, which are resonant one forms, but they are not closed. And the way you can produce the non-closed ones is effectively by rotating the closed ones by pi over two. You can show that each of those resonant one forms will be uh, a section of a, of a smaller piece of the cotangent bundle to M. And that's a two-dimensional bundle and it has a 90 degree rotation. And this commutes with the flow in case of constant curvature. Because for constant curvature metrics, the geodesic flow is conformal. So the parallel transport along the flow is going to be a conformal map, or you know, the, the expansion rate on stable and stable spaces also is, is a conformal map. So if you take a stable vector, so a vector in the stable space, and you propagate it along the differential of the geodesic flow, the length is going to be exactly e to the minus t times the length of the original vector, no matter which vector you chose. And so you have this two-dimensional stable space and you have this conformal map. Well, it's also orientation preserving. Any conformal map, so that's orientation preserving, has to commute with multiplication by 90 degrees in, in, two, in, in, in plane geometry. And so that's how we get this extra symmetry, this extra operator that commutes with the geodesic flow and it produces more resonant one forms than just the closed ones. And variable curvature is destroyed because in variable curvature, geodesic flow is no longer conformal. Different directions will be then, you know, will, will, will go to zero, say, along the stable space at different speeds. And so you do not have this symmetry anymore. So, yeah, so we get this kind of 90 degree action on, uh, on resonant one forms. And it turns out that non trivial closed forms are sent to non closed forms. And you can actually see that the space of resonant one forms is the direct sum of this. You could probably do it using Selberg trace formula, but we do it in a more geometric way using the geometry of hyperbolic. All right, and so that tells you why the dimension of the resonant one forms is bigger. So that there is no Jordan box here, it turns out. And the dimension is twice the first Betty number because we have these extra things that, uh, that are not closed. All right, well, we also show a little, you know, we, we, we also study what happens for two forms and it's uh, complicated um, to, to describe maybe, but uh, in particular, you actually get Jordan blocks for the hyperbolic case in two forms, which again, justifies why we should really think about 
resident, you know, generalized resident states rather than just resident states because Jordan blocks do appear in the hyperbolic case. All right, so what happens for perturbation? So you see in the case of hyperbolic metric, we have a basically a full description of what happens as, as, as much as is realistically possible. So if you, if you tell me the, if you basically, if you tell me what the harmonic forms are on, on, on your three, on your hyperbolic three manifold, I can give you a very precise description of what all the objects that I mentioned before. Well, now what we're going to do is we're going to perturb the metric. Now, so our result applies to perturbations only. So as you can guess, we'll probably use some kind of variation of eigenvalue. Okay, so going back to a spectral problem, if you have a matrix A, and so here what happens is um, our, our operator, it's um, the space of resonant one forms is twice as big as we want it to be. Now the closed one forms are not going to go away. We show that they're always there. We want the non-closed ones to go away. Okay, let's look at a simpler situation. Imagine you have an operator A or a matrix A, and you know that it has a kernel at zero. So it has an eigenvalue at zero. Well, now you want to perturb this eigenvalue, right? So you want to perturb your A and see where the eigenvalue moves. And you hope that it's going to move away from zero. Well, how do you show that a function that's zero at zero is not zero in a neighborhood? Well, really the, the only way I know is to compute enough derivatives and show that they are non-zero, right? Sometimes you need to go to second variation, but here we use first variation. So we just perturb our metric and see how do these eigenvalues move, or rather what happens to the non-closed resonant one forms. We want them to move and become resonant states at non-zero values of one. Well, for that, you need to show that something is non-zero. And what do you need to show? Well, you need to show, let, let's say for simplicity, my Betty number is one. So I'm just uh, talking about numbers around the matrices. You need to show that if you take any resonant one form, which is non-closed, then you pair it with, uh, you take du, so that's non-zero, you pair it with a corresponding co-resonant one form, so that's a four form. Then you pair it with alpha, which is a contact form, so it's a five form, and then you multiply by the pullback of the conformal factor to the sphere bundle, then you should get something that's non-zero. You know, in general, the derivative of the eigenvalue is the perturbation, the derivative of the perturbation applied to an eigenfunction and paired with the co-eigenfunction, right? And that's that's this formula. So we want that to be non-zero. If we know that this is non-zero, then we can see that things move away. And then with more work, we, we can show that this whole picture holds for perturbations. Well, oh, sorry. Yes, there's more question. Yeah, because I, I, I should stop at, uh, it's a 60 minutes, right? Yeah, it's 60 minutes, but uh, we-, we All right, uh, question. You're showing that IU will move off the eigenvalue for closed U, uh, for non-closed U. So it's, I, I skipped some details. It's a good question, Lior. I, I, I skipped some details because, you know, there are some computations there, uh, which are, some of them are more straightforward than others. But so if I have a non-closed, what I want is I take a one form, which is non-closed, and I want that to be moved away. So not the closed ones and non-closed ones. But it turns out that, you know, you, you compute what's the quantity you need and you can write it out first in terms of this 90 degree rotation operator and so on. But then it, it reduces to, to this expression that features du twice. So that turns out to be the, the correct expression. After some computation, which, which we do in the paper, uh, it turns out this is the thing you want to be non-zero. At least you can see if u is closed, then this is automatically zero, right? <laughs> because du is zero. And so it's... At least it has the right kind of flavor and, and it, it, it's quadratic in U. And this J star of DU is really the co-eigen state. J, J is the operation, right? X V to X minus V. It's the, it's the time reversal symmetry for the J delta. Right? So we need, we, need, we need this to be non-zero. Now we have a freedom of choosing A generically. A is my conformal factor perturbation. So that's a smooth function on, uh, on, um, but it's a smooth function in the base. You see, my one form is a form on the sphere bundle because everything was on the sphere bundle, really. But my conformal factor is a perturbate, you know, it's, it's just a function on the base manifold. Just like, you know, if you get a, if you take a conformal perturbation of the metric, it corresponds to taking a conformal perturbation of the contact form upstairs, but it has to be by a function on the base only. 
So there's plenty of perturbations of the geodesic flow, which are not geodesic flow of a perturbation of a metric. There are ways, in, you know, many ways to perturb the geodesic flow as a flow that you're not going to get the geodesic flow of a Riemannian metric. So there's much less freedom here. So you have this three-dimensional space in which A lives, this three-dimensional manifold, and then you pull it up to the five-dimensional manifold, and then you want this integral to be non -zero. So you need to show that this is non-zero for generic. It's the same as showing it's non-zero for, for one A. It, it's a linear condition as far as A is concerned, right? But in order to do this, you need to show that the push forward of this expression, which features this uh, uh, resonant one form, is going to be non-zero. That's really what we need to show. We need to show that this distribution is not identically zero. Well, how do you show that something is non-zero? You compute it, right? But there is a little bit of a problem because you're trying to show that a distribution is non-zero. So how would you show that a function is non-zero? Well, um, okay, one way to do it is to show that the integral of the function is non-zero. <laughs> then it's non-zero. Here, you can integrate this form and you get zero. So that, that, that is not something that we can do. And even if we could think about it, the Betty number could be huge. So we would need a certain big matrix to be non-degent. We need potentially a lot of freedom and perturbation depending on how, how complicated the apology is. And, uh, you know, the, the integral is just one number, right? So, well, another way you could show that a function is non-zero is you can evaluate it at one point and show it's non-zero, right? Now, you do not have this possibility for distributions. So this push forward, the expression that I want non-zero for my first variation of, uh, of this eigenvalue to be non-zero, it's a distribution. So how do you show that a distribution is non-zero? Well, looking at the definition of a distribution, you have to present a test function, so a smooth function, so that the integral against the smooth function is going to be non-zero. But there aren't so many interesting canonical smooth functions on a compact three manifold. And so, um, so we have to uh, do something here. And so the difficulty in this part of the paper I mean, it, it's not, I'm not trying to say that proving what I'm going to say here is trivial, but my feeling was the difficulty was finding the, kind, the correct kind of expression that you can compute that makes sense and it's non-zero. And so the expression we found is this. So here's my F. So this is this push forward. It's, you know, it's, it's a three form. So I can write really as F times the volume form for some distribution F on the base uh, three manifold. And so what we do is the following. We um, take the, um, we, we, we convolve it as the Koch kernel. So, I mean, this operator, it looks at hoc. There is a reason why it comes up, but you can think about it this way. So if I take a, any point X on a manifold, okay? Now let me take a big geodesic disk centered at X. Let me integrate my function on that. And here I integrate it with a weight with, which exponentially decays as, as you get farther and farther from X. Okay, so that, that would make sense. And this kind of, a, kind of a geodesic convolution, right, with this weight. Now we, what we do it is, well, we would do it on a disk of, you know, of, of infinite size. So we integrate uh, along the geodesics with this weight. If you want, it's a function of the Laplacian. Which function? Well, I, I don't have a nice formula for this function, but the, you can write it as an infinite product if you really want. So it's some function of the Laplacian, which is rapidly decaying, in particular with, with map distributions to smooth functions. But um, so this particular expression turns out to work for us for reasons that I'll keep mysterious today. And if you apply it to this distribution, then what you get is the following. So this U, uh, it projects onto a harmonic one form on sigma, that, that or alpha which do you project to a harmonic one form on sigma, that there, there is a nice correspondence there in, in the hyperbolic world. And so let's call this harmonic one form sigma. And then it turns out that this Q for F is some constant times the Laplacian of the length, pointwise length of this harmonic form. So if this F was zero, then Q for F would also be zero. So this Laplacian would be zero. Now here I'm talking about a smooth function. In any case, you know, you would know that you would have a harmonic one form of constant length, and there is a topological argument, uh, I think was known sometime before, uh, that uh, this is not possible. So that's, that's ultimately the, 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 the quantity that we get to be non-zero. 
All right, I should really stop. I'll finish with two conjectures. One is that whatever we said all happens for generic perturbation. We conjecture it happens for generic manifolds and you can try to make it you know, work in higher dimensions. Well, you can conjecture anything you want, right? That hasn't been proven false yet. And uh, two is uh, something related to Fritz conjecture and the value, but I'll, I'll. All right, thank you for your attention. Sorry for running over. Actually, I didn't, it's exactly one. No, 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 exactly. <laughs> Uh, thanks a lot for uh, the presentation today. Uh, we have some time uh, for questions now, so if you have them, either uh, unmute yourself chat. or write them. Oh, okay, very nice. Thank you. Sammy, maybe could I ask uh, what's special about dimension three here? Well, three is uh, bigger than two and less than four. So the <laughs> dimension two, I mean, if we don't want to get esoteric, dimension one doesn't make sense. So the dimension two was already done, mm -hmm. and the answer was different. What happens in dimension four is, uh, I think Dunker, Moore, Riviere, and Shen, they actually computed the dimensions of the generalized resonance spaces, and they found that in the hyperbolic case, it doesn't just depend on the topology, it also depends on certain specific special eigenfunctions, uh, eigenvalues of the Laplacian, which are not zero. So that makes it less hopeful. But, you know, we, yeah, anyway, so that's that. Uh, it's, it's conceivable that for a hyperbolic case or general local asymmetric cases, the situation for the hyperbolic or local asymmetric metric itself can be figured out in any dimension. Mm -hmm. I mean, in a way, people have, have, have done it. I don't know if they've done kind of geometric or not that we can plug it in, but the, the, the answers become more complicated. You, you, you could try to... Uh, it, 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 it would take non-trivial effort to adapt this to the case of higher dimensions. I see. And you think that your, your proof in particular would not, there's parts of it which would not carry through? Like well, the there is a lot of parts that would not, uh, I mean, the general theory sure applies, but the, um, you, you don't that, expect okay. the, you, 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 you know, it's like we analyze one forms, two forms, you know, the, the analysis would be different because the, the structure already of one forms would be different. And then, Kuster and Weiss in their paper surely have a fairly good understanding of resonant one forms there. But, uh, well, no, only the closed ones. And then you, you, you're just going to get a different answer, as, as can be witnessed already by this Zeta computation of, of the, the Don Guillermo Rivier and Shen that I mentioned. Mm -hmm. I think it's an interesting project, but it's, uh, I mean, the in dimension two, the moral is that everything is very nice. And we did not expect that when, when we were doing this, all their work was worse. We, we thought it would move on. In dimension three, things are difficult again. And in dimension four, well, my guess, the, the, the moral will be things are even more difficult. Sure. But still interesting to me. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Mia, for the question. Do we have other questions for uh, Simeon? There is one uh, oh, by chat. Okay, let me open chat. chat. Yeah. On slide three, what's the operator between two norms for estimation? Oh, this, that's, um, okay. So it's a question about definition of hyperbolic property. So phi t is a flow, right? Depending on t. And then I want to, my, for example, ES is a sub bundle, which is invariant under phi t. So ES is a subspace of the tangent space mm -hmm. at any point. So here, this is uniform in the point. So I take an arbitrary point in the tangent, in the, in the unit tangent bundle. Let's call it rho. Then I have the tangent space at rho. That's a five dimensional space for, 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 for three many. Um, uh, right. And then you get uh, this ES is a two dimensional space. So you just, you, you take this differential of phi t and it will map the stable space at rho to the stable space at phi t of rho. And I want the norm of that to decay. Because of the constant here and my manifold being compact, it doesn't matter what norm I fixed on the, on the fibers of the tangent bundle as long as it's here. So that's what we mean by exponential. You know, when I do these things in person, I sometimes uh, do a version of dance that much as Worski does, uh, which is when, when, you, when you perturb in a stable direction, you are, you know, if you perturb infinitesimal in a stable direction, the old jet, the new jet does it converges exponentially fast to the new jet does it. That's how you can think of it geometrically. But mathematically, it's, it's nice to formulate in terms of one. All right. All right. Thanks. Questions. Maybe we have, we have time for another question. Yes, uh, Laura. Um, yeah. Um, so it seems this seems to indicate uh, that uh, there's no that anywhere you perturb your metric, your hyperbolic metric, you're going to break the invariance uh, rotation uh, by pi over two. 
Uh, do you think that's also true if you consider more general perturbation of the uh, geodesic? Uh... Uh, yes. So it's uh, the question is out uh, related to this theorem. So um, well, let me first answer and then I'll, I'll give a remark about the question also. The, here we consider conformal perturbations. As I said, we we'll probably could have considered general metric perturbations. We'll probably give the same result with a bit, with a bit longer computation. If you perturb the flow, so if you, well, if you perturb it within the class of contact flows, it's always um, you know, all, all contact manifolds that are nearby are just conformal to each other. You know, there, there's no deformation there of contact structures, right? That's, I forgot what's the name of that theorem, but anyway, so it's, it's always gonna be a conformal perturbation of the contact flow. And we actually have a theorem that if you perturb the contact form, generically a little bit, then you will also have this, uh, this answer. It's a simpler theorem to prove because you have more degree of freedom. You can use the result of Weish that just shows that, uh, where, where is the thing? Where is it? It's instead of showing that this push forward is non-zero, you just have to show that the form itself is non-zero, which is, which is uh, considerably easier. And in fact, you can show it has full support. But I should caution that we only do it for generic perturbations. So there is, uh, there is, I anticipate that there is a finite co-dimension set of perturbations for which the degree of vanishing would be exactly the same as in the hyperbolic case. Okay. Just because if you think of a matrix depending with, with um, values, you know, if you start with a matrix zero, <laughs> And then you perturb it so you have an M by M matrix and it has uh, entries which depend holomorphically, we'll even say, on some parameters. The dimension of the eigenspace at zero, well, it, it will be stratified, right? And for a generic small matrix, it will have no eigenvalue at zero, but there will be all this mm. positive co dimension strata where a lot of things can happen. And so in our situation, it's, it's not going to get simpler than that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, which is also why our conjecture here is really for uh, generic metrics. Yeah, which I think is probably the best you can realistically uh, expect. And does knowing the um, multiplicity of zero have consequences on like as asymptotics by some Tobarian means or something like that? Asymptotics of, uh, sorry, I didn't hear I don't know. Geodesics counting or something like that? Or no. So uh, I gave a very short disclaimer somewhere near the beginning yeah. <laughs> that we don't, the, so if you think about the singularities of the zeta functions, like, you know, but by analogy with the, the Riemann zeta function. So the first pull of the Riemann zeta function is at one and the, the only one. The and that corresponds to the, to, 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 to the prime number theorem, right? And then if you want to push a little bit past this one, that's where the you know, Riemann hypothesis, prime number theorem come in and so on. But in our case, the first pole of this zeta function or the first singularity is not at zero actually. It's at the topological entropy of the flow. It corresponds, the corresponding currents, I think correspond to Margulis measures, even though I'm not sure anybody has ever really figured out you know, legally how to write micro locally. And so, and the, you know, the topological entropy is some positive number. So it's pushing a bit past the topological entropy is where you get, this is what Julia to the Varanian polygon, for example, we're doing, where you get improvements in prime geodesic theorem. Our thing is all the way down to zero, which is very deep, but it's still kind of fascinating that it has to do with, uh, with the topology. Thank you, uh, Laura, for the question. Do we have any other questions uh, for Simeon? Right, well, uh, Thanks again, Simeon, for uh, the talk today. We will reconvene next week with a talk by uh, Bram Petri.